This week, the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam and the armies of Minnesota clash. Old General Robert E. Lee spends the 18th anxiously worrying about being pursued by Major General George B. McClellan. And after a truce to bury the dead, he orders his commanders to withdraw from Sharpsburg. He also orders his commanders to form corps. Lee forms a rear guard of 45 heavy guns, two brigades, all under the command of Bird General William N. Pendleton, who form a rear guard at Botworth's Ford. On the 19th, Union Brigadier General Charles Griffin sends out two regiments, the 4th Michigan and 1st U.S. Sharpshooters, to pursue the Army of Northern Virginia. They go crashing into Pendleton's rear and do work against the beleaguered rebels, capturing four cannons. Pendleton, report Pendleton reports this to Lee, but an exhibit communication leads Lee to believe that all the cannons have been lost. After a successful day for the Union, the troops are recalled. Major General Fitz John Porter sends out two of his brigades on the morning of the 20th against the rear guard again. One of these brigades is of regulars, which assaults Major General A.P. Hill's force ahead of the ford. Confederates are forced back across the ford, sending them charge the Union again. Porter's artillery breaks up the charge, and his infantry repulses it. Porter then sends in three more of his brigades to take the heights on the other side of the Potomac, but the Confederates rallied and reformed on the high points. Union can't seem to push the two divisions there. Porter doesn't wish to risk anything in order to general withdrawal. His forces fall back, except one regiment, the 118th Pennsylvania, or Corn Exchange Regiment. Their colonel will only follow orders through the very strict chain of command. By the time that order gets through, the regiment takes 36% casualties. With the Confederate victory, they held the height. The Union lost 73 killed, 163 wounded, 132 captured or missing. The Confederates 36 killed, 267 wounded, Six captured or missing. The cost of the battle dissuades both Lee and McClellan from engaging again. Thus ends the Maryland campaign, a Union victory. Union suffered 14,756 casualties and the Confederates 16,409. McClellan has repulsed the Confederate assault on the capital, and the Army of Northern Virginia is on the retreat, back to its namesake state. But back to the 19th for the Battle of Iuka, Mississippi. Ever since Major General Ulysses Grant has gotten his 100-men army, he hasn't been able to do anything except guard communications and supply lines. Major General Don Carlos Buell has been heading the offensive for the federal forces in the West. But now the war has changed there. The Union is no longer on the offensive, but has to play defense. Old General Braxton Bragg wishes to engage and destroy General Buell's Army of the Ohio, but in order for there to be even the slightest possibility of that happening, he must make sure Buell will receive no reinforcements. Grant must have no way of knowing about Buell's situation and or no way of being able to react to it. For this, he entrusts Major General Earl Van Dorn and Sterling Price, veterans of the Battle of Pea Ridge, with the reformed Army of the West. They are to stop Grant's army. On the 13th, Sterling Price with a 3,000 or so man vanguard reached Ayuka and skirmished with Union pickets defending the depot nearby. <laughs> On the 14th, Union Garrison burned the depot and left for Corinth. The leader of this garrison is relieved of command for this foolish action. General Price sits in Iuka, waiting for Major General Earl Van Dorn to arrive with his 7,000 men so they can press the assault. Major General Grant will not just wait around. Iuka is an important town, the meeting point of a major road and a railroad. Major General William Rusebrands comes up with a daring plan, as Ayuka is his area to cover, and he knows it quite well. Major General Edward Ord will be given three divisions, who in total number 8,000 men, who will move directly east along the memphis Corinth Railroad to take Price head-on. While Rusebrands will move from a further south position using the Mobile and Ohio Railroads that press east, so he can cut off Price's retreat. To, to, do, to do this, he has two divisions, who number 9,000 men. Grant decides to keep his headquarters with Ord's forces. On the 18th, Ord arrives and skirmishes with Price, but Roosevelt is still 20 miles away. On the 19th, Roosevelt makes a decision. He will use only one road, Wachinto Road, in his march. Grant decides to move Ord closer, but not to engage with Price until he hears the sounds of battle. And Price makes a decision. He declines Ord's offer of surrender, and then he receives word from Van Dorn. 
that he won't move Tayuka and instead he should meet at Rienzi. Price decides he will make that move tomorrow. At 4 p.m., Rouge Clan's lead brigade, Colonel John B. Sanborns, disperses Confederate pickets. The battle has begun. His two divisions of Bird General Charles Hamilton and Bird General David S. Stanley rapidly push forward until 4.30 when Price sends in his only division under Bird General Lewis H. Whittle to counterattack. Sanborn's brigade is battered. It is of no matter. Ford will move in soon. Hamilton deploys his other brigade under Bird General Jeremiah C. Sullivan. The battle is fierce, with the two forces being disastrously close, making large formations hard to form. Confederate Bird General Lewis Herbert charges with his brigade. He takes a volley at 300 feet away from the entire federal line before him. The brigade continues forward and reaches the battery when it is repulsed at point-blank range. He reforms and charges again and is blasted again. Not willing to give up his advanced position, Herbert charges again and takes the gun. But he is now stuck. The horses for the cannon have died. He will not take the setback lightly, and Bird General Stanley deploys his force, standing the line, and now has a 4-3 to three advantage in numbers, 4,500 to 3,200 to be specific. The Confederates try to push, but Stanley's forces repulse the enemies. The forces continue to engage at a close distance. But no major movement is taken until 9 p.m. when the battle is ended. But this doesn't mean it wasn't deadly. As Price recalls, the fierceness of the battle he has never seen surpassed. That night, after talking with his generals, General Price withdraws, using the road Rushkins did not take. The Union suffered 782 casualties to 700 of the Confederates. But they do reclaim what was left after the burning of the garrison on the 14th and the city. Why did Ord join in the fighting? Well, he couldn't hear the sound of battle due to an acoustic shadow. It doesn't matter. Grant is pleased with the result. I cannot speak too highly of the energy and skill displayed by General Bruce Prince in the attack, with the endurance of the troops under him. General Ord's command showed untiring zeal in the direction taken by them and prevented them from taking the active part they desired. Price is not as pleased. He did survive, but is weaker than before the battle, and lost his divisional commander, Bird General Whittle, who caught a bullet in the eye but he is able to move to Major General Earl Van Dorn. From there, we return to the East and the aftermath of the Battle of Antietam. Throughout the summer, I have reported the writing of a proclamation from President Abraham Lincoln. After urging from Secretary of State William Seward, he agreed to wait till a major Union victory. Antietam qualifies, so on the 22nd, he releases the Emancipation Proclamation by the President of the United States of America. A proclamation. I... Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States of America, Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, hereof do hereby proclaim and decide that hereafter, as heretofore, the war will be prosecuted for the object of practically restoring the constitutional relation between the United States and each of the states, the people thereof, in which states that relation is or may be suspended or disturbed. That is my purpose. Upon the next meeting of Congress to again recommend the adoption of a practical measure tendering Pecuniary aid to the free acceptance or rejection of all slave states, so called, the people whereof may not then be in rebellion against the United States, in which states may then have voluntarily adopted or thereafter may voluntarily adopt me or gradual abolishment of slavery within their respective limits. And that the effort to colonize persons of African descent with their consent upon this continent or elsewhere, the previously obtained consent of the governments existing there will be continued. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority, thereof will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, will do no act or acts to repress such persons, or any of them, in any efforts they may make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of January, after said, by proclamation, designate the states, and part of states, if any, 
which the people thereof respectively shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto. Elections wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall in the absence of strong countervailing testimony be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. That attention is hereby called to an act of Congress entitled An Act to Make an Additional Article of War, approved March 13, 1862. The is in the words and figures following, be enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America, Congress assembled, that hereafter the following shall be promulgated as an additional article of war for the government of the Army of the United States, and shall be obeyed and observed as such. Article, all officers or persons of the military or naval service of the United States are prohibited employing any of the forces under their respective commands for the purpose of returning fugitives from service or labor who may have escaped from any persons to whom such service or labor is claimed to be due. And any officer shall be found guilty by a court-martial of violating this article shall be dismissed from the service. Section 2. And be it further enacted that this act shall take effect from and after its passage. Also to the ninth and tenth sections of an act entitled An Act to Suppress Insurrection, to punish treason and rebellion, to seize and confiscate property of rebels, and for other purposes. Approved July 17, 1862. And which sections are in the words and figures following? Section 9. And be it further enacted that all slaves of persons who shall hereafter be engaged in rebellion against the government of the United States, or shall in any way give aid or comfort thereto, seeming from such persons and taking refuge within the lines of the army, and all slaves captured from such persons, or deserted by them in coming under the control of the government of the United States, and all slaves of such persons found on or being within any place occupied by rebel forces and afterwards occupied by the forces of the United States, shall be deemed captives of war, and shall be forever free of their servitude and not again held as slaves. Section 10. And be it further enacted that no slave escaping into any state, territory, or the District of Columbia from any other state shall be delivered up or in any way impeded or hindered of his liberty, except for crime, or some offense against the laws, unless the person claiming said fugitive shall first make oath that the person to whom the labor and service of such fugitive is alleged to be due is his lawful owner, and has not borne arms against the United States in the present rebellion, nor in any way given aid and comfort thereto, and no person engaged in the military or naval service, the United States shall, under any pretense whatever, assume to decide on the validity of the claim of any person to this to the service or waiver of any other person, or surrender up any such person to the claimant on pain of being dismissed from the service. And I do hereby enjoin upon and order all persons engaged in the military naval service of the United States to observe, obey, and enforce within their respective spheres of service the act and sections above recited. And the executive will in due time recommend that all citizens of the United States who shall have remained loyal thereto throughout the rebellion shall, upon the restoration of the constitutional relation between the United States and their respective states and people, if that relation shall have been suspended or disturbed, be compensated for all losses by acts of the United States, including the loss of slaves. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand to cause the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington. This 22nd day of September, in the year of our Lord, 1862, and of the independence of the United States, the 87th. Signed, Abraham Lincoln, by the President. Signed, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. This is obviously a huge and impactful order, whose repercussion shall be seen throughout all time. I will talk about it more next week. At the point determined on we planned to hide a large number of men on one side of at the point determined on we planned to hide a large number of men on the side of the road, near the lake, in a ravine formed by the outlet, we were to place another strong body behind a hill to the west, were to be some more men. We thought that when Sibley marched out along the road, and when the head of his column had reached the farther end of the line of our first division, our men would open fire. The men in the ravine would then be in the rear of the whites, 
would begin firing on that end of the column. The men from behind that would rush out and attack the flank, and we had horsemen far out of the right and the left who would come up. We expected to throw the whole white force to confusion by the sun and an unexpected attack and defeat them before they could rally. I think this was a good plan of battle. We thought this would be the deciding fight of the war. We could hear them laughing and saying our concealed men would not have been discovered. The grass was tall, and the place by the road and the ravine were good hiding places. We had learned that Sibley was not particular about sending out scouts to examine the country before he passed it. He had a number of mounted men, but they always rode together at the head of the column, went on a march. They did not examine the ground at the sides of the road. I am pleased to announce, at great cost of the publication, we brought in a correspondence for the Dakota War. Off to them. On the morning of the 23rd, at 4 a.m., Sibley's camp was awakened. At 7 a.m., they traversed the camp for breakfast, except for one regiment, the 3rd Minnesota, a regiment still angered by its own surrender earlier in the war. They are famished, so they then, without orders, drive their wagons to the Upper Sioux Agency, unknowingly in the direction of a Sioux ambush. Our men were lying, hidden, waiting patiently. Some were very near the camp lines in the ravine, but the whites did not see a man of all our men. Do not think they would have discovered our abundance. It seemed a considerable time after sunup when some four or five wagons with a number of soldiers started out from the camp in the direction of the old yellow medicine agency. We learned afterwards that they were going without orders to dig potatoes over at the agency, five miles away. They came over the prairie, right where part of our line was. Some of the wagons were not in the road, and if they had kept straight on, would have driven right over our men as they lay in the grass. At last they came so close that our men had to rise up and fire. This brought on the fight, of course, but not according to the way we had planned it. Little Crow saw it and felt very badly. The Dakota surprised the Minnesotans. The 3rd Minnesota fought back just as hard. 200 Union infantry strike the Sioux warriors, and 70 stay in reserve. The 3rd Minnesota don't break ranks and are able to lay down a consistent fire. Our thorough drill in the south showed here to good advantage. Our skirmish line moved steadily forward, firing rapidly, forcing me back towards the bluffs of the Minnesota River. The scene from the reserve at this point remains vivid in my mind. The savages formed a semicircle in our front, to the right and left, moving about with great activity, howling like demons, firing and retreating, their quick movements seemingly to multiply their numbers. We were whipped them in fine shape, driving them back over the undaunting prairie. A retrospect brings to mind Tennyson's charge of the White Brigade with Indians to the right of us, Indians to the left of us, Indians in front of us, whooping and yelling when suddenly an officer from General Sylvie came charging in upon us, hastily calling for Major Welch. Approaching that officer, he spoke a few words to him, then wheeling his horse, he shouted, Get back to camp the best way you can! He spit away as though he had just escaped out from the mouth of hell. Will Crow rode at a short distance from a mounted group, and swinging his blanket above his head, gave the war whoop. When an answering yell rang from the prairie, and scores of Indians, not before seen, rose from the grass until, when it was present state, the whole prairie seemed to be alive with them. Colonel Sibley hears the disaster unfolding before him. One of his veteran regiments is exposed, so he hands the order to withdraw to one of his officers, who rides with haste towards the wayward infantry. The reserves about faced. The skirmishers on the right came running up and on the reserve. Sergeants McDonald and Bauer on the left kept the line of skirmishers steady, fighting their way back to the reserve. About from this point, about one mile from the camp, back over the line to over which we had just moved, was disordered and independent, each man doing his best. The human fusillade was poured into their converging ranks. Our line of retreat laid down a descent to the creek we had crossed, with rolling hills on either side. Here was pandemonium itself. Indians to the right of us, Indians to the left of us, Indians behind us, charging and yelling. The commander of the 3rd Minnesota is wounded, but the regiments make it back to camp. Reinforced by the Renville Rangers, a regiment of light infantry sharpshooters of mixed descent. These rangers hold off the Sioux warband long enough for the 3rd Minnesota to regroup and return to the fight. The soldiers charge without orders, crashing into the mess of Dakota warriors. And... At this time, Lieutenant Olin of the 3rd with about 50 men made a wild charge, completely routing those in our front. The charge was so sudden and unexpected by them that we came nearly to hand-to-hand -hand encounter. 14 or 15 were here killed and fell into our hands, they having no time to carry them away. About the din of musketry and the war whoops of the Indians, remember the horse of Sergeant J.M. Bauer, for like a madman, 
Remember Murphy Spiro. Fight boys. Remember Murphy Spiro. The friendly Dakota gets the worst of it, with one warband suffering a 61% casualty rate. Little Crow's men are broken up, and Colonel Sibley notices, ordering the 7th Minnesota to assault the Sioux with artillery. The rest of the 7th Minnesota takes up positions in the battleworks. Colonel Marshall, the regiment's leader, extends his line in a giant skirmishing formation and presses on. Gradually advancing the line, the men keeping close to the ground and firing as they crawled forward. I gained a good position from which to charge the Indians. Here we were joined by Captain Grant's Here we were joined by Captain Grant's company, the 6th Regiment, in charge successfully dislodging the Indian. Marshall then leaves behind men to guard the cannon as the rest move to pursue the retreating Sioux. But an order from Colonel Sibley stops them. Sibley is not comfortable with the victory yet. He orders a company of the 6th to take the ridge. The company finds a Dakota party ready to flank Sibley. After a hard fight, they send the warband to rout. The Indians that were in the fight did well, but hundreds of our men did not get into it, did not fire a shot. They were out too far. The men in the ravine and the line connecting them, but those on the road did them most of the fighting. Those of us on the hill did our best. We were soon driven off. West drove our men out of the ravine by a charge, and that ended the battle. The battle raged for about two hours. The six men of the mountain now served being used with great effect, when the Indians, repulsed at all points with great loss, retired with precipitation. I regret to say that many casualties occurred on our side. Four men were killed, and between 35 and 40 were wounded. Most of them, I rejoice to hear, not seriously. Little Crow returns to his camp, distraught he knows it's all over. His hope of stopping Sibley quashed. The friendly faction now encompasses most of his army. 700 picked warriors whipped by the cowardly whites. Better run away and scatter out over the plains like buffalo and woods. Be sure the whites had big guns and better arms than the Indians and outnumbered us 4 or 5 to 1. That is no reason we should not have whipped them, for we are brave men, while they are cowardly women. Cannot account for their disgraceful defeat. Must be the work of traitors in our myths. Would be bad policy for the whites. Will then follow us to the ends of the earth and give us no peace. It would be cruel and cowardly too. A messenger soon arrives from his camp, demanding his surrender. The long merchant Sibley would like to put the rope around my neck, but he won't get the chance. The messenger then asks for Little Crow to release his captives. To this, there is no joke, just a nod from a man who knows he is dead. Little Crow gives the order, but some of his men won't listen. Let them alone. Too many women and children have been killed already. We have killed only men. We can make peace now. Later, Little Crow with 100 loyal men flees. A friendly camp set up a camp with a trench to protect themselves. From the hostile camp, waiting for the chance to surrender from Sibley. Thanks, Marshal. Wait, the war is over? Yeah. Now seems like a really bad investment in the correspondent. Anyways, the rest of the week. And this week has gone on long enough. What else? The 24th, a naval battle off the coast of Texas with no casualties. And the Confederate Senate creates a seal that will never be used. On the 25th, that bloodless naval battle continues to be bloodless. The city of Sabine then surrenders to the Union. Then, there is Sickles. He is in D.C. when he receives news of the victory at Antietam. He is delighted. His division is gathering its strength at amazing speed, and will be more than ready for the next campaign. As for Dan himself, he is gathering further allies, joining in Mary Todd Lincoln's seances and parties, with esteemed guests like Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts or Senator Ira Harris of New York. That's where the week ends. And all I can say, a lot. The end of the Maryland campaign and the threat of Lee marching on D.C. The Emancipation Proclamation is ending slavery in the rebellious states. And the Sioux War is coming to a close. A complete 180 for the Union. On paper. But the question is, will it be enough? The midterms are coming. The Republicans have both a majority in the House and Senate. Can they keep it? Will the Emancipation Proclamation be a rallying cry, pushing the Union forward, or an empty promise that can't be fulfilled? For this week, I would like to thank the amazing Field Marshal with his own YouTube channel, which is in the description and will be in the comments below, for being my Sioux War correspondent. He does amazing videos on the War of Spanish Succession. You should really check him out. I would also like to thank my two amazing patrons, Kevin Mack and John Fox, 
for their continued support. We'll continue to bring whatever this is to you every week. You should be seeing now on the screen recommendations for other videos, a playlist, and to subscribe. I hope that you will do all three and at least two. Thank you, and I will see you next week.